like you to welcome Pastor Bill Geiger, who's come to preach for us today. Thank you. I turned on the mic and the mic says low battery. If it dies, I can probably speak loud enough for you all to hear me, but if not, just give me a sign and I'll pick this thing up. Um, I'm just really excited to be with you guys today. Um, I really enjoy coming and ministering here in this body. Um, you guys are so welcoming, welcoming and warming to me that I feel like I'm part of the congregation to a small degree, you know, kind of like the distant cousin who comes, you know, once every two or three months or whatever. And uh, I just really appreciate being with you guys. I'm very excited because I feel like I have good news to share with you today. Really, 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 really good news to share with you today. Now, sometimes when you're a pastor, the message that you have to deliver is kind of heavy. And I'm not saying I'm going to give you good news and not give you a chance to repent. There's not going to be some conviction and some change going on in our hearts. But basically, it's kind of like when you preach a funeral for somebody and they really loved God and they really lived God, for God and there's not very much doubt about where they, where they ended up, okay? And then you have to preach for the other person who lived a different way and it's, it's a lot harder and whatever. This morning, I'm just really, really, really glad that God has allowed me to bring this message to you, and it's full of good news. One author wrote, Dear Lord, I've been rereading the record of the rich young ruler and his obviously wrong choice, but this set me thinking. No matter how much wealth he had, he could not ride in a car, he could not have any surgery, he could not turn on a light, he could not buy penicillin, he could not hear a pipe organ, watch TV, wash dishes in running water, type a letter, mow a lawn, or fly in an airplane, sleep on an inner spring mattress, or talk on the phone. If he was rich, then what am I this morning? If he was rich, then what am I this morning? This morning we're going to be focused on the riches of the Lord, the what and the how and the process for properly applying them to my life or to our lives. This book, 2 Peter, along with 1 Peter, was written by the apostle to remind the people of the truths that they had received. You see, even in the first generation before the apostles passed from the scene, the church was beginning to forget the important things that they were told. They were forgetting to apply them and, and to, do, to do them in their lives. So Peter wrote 1 and 2 Peter as an as a, uh, exhortation to them to strive to, to remind them of the great things that they have been instructed of and how to apply them to their lives. Um, he penned these two, leader, two letters to stir us and them to remembrance. Can I have you all stand with me as we read the word of God together this morning? We're going to be looking at 2 Peter chapter 1. I'll give you a second if you've got your Bibles with you. 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 3 through 9 this morning. 3 through 9. It says... His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Say everything. Okay. Now, guys, I'm going to have a lot of back and forth between me and you this morning. So when I say everything, I don't want you to think you're going to scare me. I kind of want you to use your outdoor voice, and I kind of want it to be loud and almost to the point where we can feel it. So I'm going to read that again, okay? His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Say everything. everything. Amen. Through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness, through these through through he, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. For this reason, make every effort to add your, to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in an increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind, and he has forgotten that he has been cleansed from past sins. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you very much for the power that is in your word, Lord God. It is life and light to us today, Father. And Lord, I thank you for giving me an opportunity to preach the good news of your blessings to us, Lord. I pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to respond to your word the way that we should, Lord. I pray for your help in delivering this message, Lord, that you would help me to say nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else than what you want said, Lord. And I pray especially, Lord God, that you would give us a hunger in our souls for the blessings, Lord God, and that we would be so full of these blessings that you've given us, Lord, that they couldn't help but spill out of our lives and into the lives of others. Lord, I pray that you would cause that to come to pass this morning in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Say everything one more time. Amen. Amen. Through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and his goodness. This morning I'm going to be talking to you about three points. Actually as the spirit leads I think I might only get to one of them. But this morning I'm going to be talking to you about God's provision, God's promises, and God's prescription this morning from this passage of Scripture. God's provision. Everything we need for life and godliness, God has already provided for us. Now, I want you to stir your mind about God for just a second. Just remember that God is the most, empower, most powerful and intelligent creature in the whole universe. There's nobody as powerful as he is and nobody as smart as he is. And then the other thing is, is that God owns every single thing in the universe. Now, we may possess certain things for different times and seasons of our lives, like our house. My wife used to say, I'm just making the rent payment. And I'm like, honey, we're buying this house. This is our house. She's like, no, we're just living here for a little while. You know what I'm saying? God owns every single thing on the face of the planet, and he puts it into our hands for a season. Amen? Amen? Okay. So, God has given us everything that we need for life. He's given us food. He's given us a planet. He's given us oxygen. He's given us water. He's given us a brain. He gives us clothes and shelter and transportation and money and safety and friends and wives and husbands and mothers and fathers and hope. And guys, I want to tell you that that is not an exhaustive living or exhausted list of everything that God gives us for life on this planet. Amen. I could list uh, I could list a hundred more things, a hundred more things, maybe a thousand more things of things that God has given us for life. Now let's take an inventory. Now when I walk around my house, I see everything that I need for life. I go in the closet and there's clothes there. I go to the refrigerator and there's food there. You know what I mean? I look up and there's a roof there which keeps me dry when the, it rains there. You know what I'm saying? And I have a living room and how many of you guys are glad for the bathroom? Indoor plumbing. You know what I'm saying? Guatemala, not every, not every bathroom is indoor plumbing. Can I get an amen there? And it's like everything that we need for life, God has provided for us. Now I go down to the basement, and I'm like, wow, down there in the basement, there's a furnace, there's a hot water heater, there's a washer and a dryer, and there's boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff that I really need to be going through. But it's everything that I need for life and godliness. And then I go out into the garage, and I see all the things out in the garage. I love the smell of my garage. It's just like an awesome smell. And I see a car for going back and forth to work. I see couple push lawn mowers and a riding lawn mower and I see snowmobiles yes how many of you guys know snowmobiles are my favorite you know what I mean I got tools for working on things I've got uh, tiller for tilling my garden and I've got all kinds of things that I would need for life living here in the United States of America that God has provided for me I'm excited about that because we are truly a blessed people can I get an amen 
You know, if you live here in the United States of America, you are 95% in the top 95% of wealth of those people in the world. Just by virtue of being here, you are richer than 95% other per, 95 other percent of the people who live on the earth. And I have to be honest with you guys, I have been thinking about moving over the past few years, and I did an inventory, and I could probably happily live on about a third of the possessions that I have right now. I could probably get along just fine on that. But guys, I want to tell you that God provides for us everything that we need for life. And not only does God, well, okay, i got to answer the question. Whenever I say God will provide for you everything that you need for life, there's got to be somebody out there who's got that question like, really? Really? Has God provided for me everything that I've needed for life? I take a look at you today and you seem to be breathing. All of you seem to be wearing clothes. Um, I don't hear any growling stomachs this morning. So I could say probably with certainty that God has also provided for you everything that you need for life too. Now I want to tell you we all have wants, okay? If I could just get that other snowmobile with electric start and reverse, oh, that would just be so great. But if I needed it, I would have it. And by faith, I receive from the word of God, which says, I have everything that I need. Everything that I need. Say it out loud with me. Everything that I need for life. Hallelujah. How many of you guys are glad that it doesn't stop there, though? God gives us more than just that. He gives us everything that we need for godliness, too. He gives us the resources that we need for spiritual living. He's given us the salvation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's given us truth. He's given us wisdom and power through spirit baptism. He gives us grace. He gives us forgiveness. He gives us hope. He gives us heaven, hell, fellowship, and love. And this, too, also is not an exhaustive listing. Everything that we need for spiritual life, God has provided for us through the life, death, and resurrection of his son. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's good news. I need to be hearing some amens back there because this is great news this morning. Everything that we need for life, God has provided. Yay! Amen? Everything that we need for godliness, God has provided for us too. Amen? Amen? Everything that we need for godliness. Really? Everything that we need for godliness? Yes. With much assurance, I can tell you today that God has provided for you everything that you need for a godly life. Well, what about that temptation? Well... God's given you means to, to, to get away from that temptation, amen? Even if, even if that means is just flee and get away from there, that's a means that God has provided for you to overcome. Do you hear what I'm saying this morning? In fact, in the spiritual realm, I wish that my eyes were open and I wish that your eyes would open so that we could see that when it comes to it spiritually, that everything that God has done from beginning to end has set us up to be much more blessed than we are even when we consider the wonderful home we come from. You know what I'm saying? God has provided everything for us for spiritual living. When the day that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's like the best day of your whole life. It's better than if you hit a billion trillion dollar lotto. You know what I'm saying? You have struck it rich the day that you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is how complete uh, the thing is that God has given us. And you know, it's even more than that. The battle is won. The victory is won. The work of God is finished. And Jesus Christ is seated at God's right hand, living ever to intercede for us. And we have everything that we need. How complete is the victory of the kingdom of God over the, 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 the kingdom of darkness? It is total. It is complete. Jesus doesn't wrestle with, dev with devils, okay? Jesus speaks to them, and they do what God, God wants them to do, amen? 
you know, there's still a battle out there. Satan is still loose, and he's still trying to cause people to, to go to hell and different things like that. But when it comes to the power of God compared to the power of the enemy, the power and the victory of the kingdom of God is complete, as complete as can be. It is as total as total can be. It is as full as its fullness can be. It is settled... I've read the book, and when you cheat and read the end of the book, you can know that we win this thing. Amen? Amen. God has given us what? Everything. Say it again. Everything. Say it one more time. I like this. Everything. We need for life and godliness. Now, how do we apply this everything to our life? The scripture tells us that it is through our knowledge of him that this is the way we bring the blessing in our life, through our knowledge of him by faith. Now, at some point in your life, the Holy Spirit put a, a gift of faith in your heart. And then the Holy Spirit, a little bit later, gave you a revelation of God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And at that point, you believed to him. And just like a little seed germinating in a pot, you began to grow that day in your knowledge of him. Amen? And uh, from that point in your life, you began to grow in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, the only way that we gain knowledge is through personal exposure. And when we personally expose ourselves to the knowledge of God, it changes our lives absolutely. Amen? You cannot come in contact with the grace of God. You cannot come in contact with the love of God. You cannot come in contact with the mercy of God and not be changed if you understand what you're seeing. Amen? Amen. And it's a great thing. You know, there are many things that we expose ourselves to here in America that affect us negatively. Kind of like frostbite. Amen? Amen. And you know what frostbite does is it attacks or it focuses on an area of your body. And basically, because it's frozen, it can kill portions of your skin and you can lose pieces of your skin. You can lose toes and fingers and stuff like that. And many things that we expose ourselves in, to in society attacks us a lot like that frostbite. It kills where it contacts and corruption and different things like that kill us when we expose ourselves to them in this society. But Jesus came and he, he brings life to those things. Do you hear what I'm saying this morning? But we have to be careful what we expose ourselves to this morning. It's with great, oh, here in America, we have great many values, venues of exposure to God available to the people who live here. And some people take advantage of it and some people don't. How many of you guys know that God is so available to us here in the United States of America? Um, I'm going to get into it a little bit more, but you can have every little bit of God you want living in this country. And that's one of the things that make our country great. Amen? Amen. You can go to church and not have to worry about a massacre. You can, you can profess to be a Christian and not have to uh, worry about discrimination and different kinds of things. There may be a little bit of persecution, but by and large, we are more free to serve and to love God than any other people group on the face of the planet. Can I get an amen there? That's one of the reasons when I studied history why I began to love the United States of America is because even in its own constitution, there is an opportunity for us to serve God the way that we want to according to freedom of religion. Amen? So God is all available to us, and he is, and I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to get into the ways in just a second, but he is so available to us, but sadly... Um, it's with great remorse and shame that I have to say that many Christians here in America walk around like paupers. They are ignorant of God's riches they are available to them from the Lord. And they do not take the time that they need to expose themselves to the Lord and to his light. And we could be 
a million more times richer in the things of the Spirit and in the things of God than we are, but we just don't take the time to expose ourselves to them in order to gain the knowledge of them, in order that we could walk in them. Now, Patrick Henry said, I have now disposed all my property to my family, but there's one thing I wish I could give them, and that is faith in Jesus Christ. If they had that, and I had not given them a single shilling, they would be rich. But if they had not that, and I had given them the whole world, they would be poor, poor indeed. And Patrick Henry said that. Spiritually, here in America, we have a poverty mindset. We're focused on what we don't have rather than what God has gloriously provided. We are more focused on our nose than our goes, and we're more focused on what we don't have, and we act like spiritual whiner babies. You know, just recently, I, I tell you, I work in a detention facility with, with, uh, with uh, youth who are uh, incarcerated, and it's a secure facility and everything like that. And we had a youth come in who was a whiner baby. And it's like, eh, he complained about everything. The bed's too hard. This is, oh, my back hurts. Oh, my feet hurt. Oh, this food stinks. This stinks. That stinks. And it's like it was so bad that the kids didn't even want to hang out with him. You know what I mean? And when we walk around here in the United States of America, the most free people in the whole world, the, most peop the people with the most access to God and his great and glorious provision, and we act like spiritual wonder babies, how do you think that makes God feel? You know what I mean? And what does it do to the attractiveness of our Christianity to other people who don't know yet Jesus? Amen? Um, as I was preparing for this sermon, a lot of conviction started to come into my heart and to my mind, and I am so guilty of such attitudes and feeling very stupid because this morning I've been given so much, and I know that I should act uh, and know and live much better. You know, guys, it's infected all of us from the top to the bottom. We do not walk according to the privileges of the riches of God that he has given us in Christ Jesus. But praise God for my next sentence. And I'm going to want you to listen to it carefully because I'm going to expect you to repeat it after me when I get done saying it, okay? But it doesn't have to be this way. I want you to say that out loud this morning. Church, say it with me. It doesn't have to be this way. Now, while church attendance is at an all-time low and biblical illiteracy is rampant in our land, it doesn't have to be this way in the United States of America. There are more Bibles, there's more knowledge, and more Bible teachers available to us than ever before with the aid of technology and live streaming. There's all kinds of biblical tools that you can get just by sitting in front of a computer and accessing them. And you can learn things about the Bible that people in other generations could only wonder about. You can research. You can actively get into those kind of things. You know, um, there's things like YouTube for teachers. There's live streaming where you can stream services. There's Bible Gateway, which is deep resource tool. It allows you to look up the Greek and the Hebrew and the history and all these other kind of things. And, uh, you know, just the internet, other resources made available to us in the internet. Amen? With all that freedom, with all this technology, and all this power, you think we'd be exposing ourselves to the kingdom of God a lot more. Amen? Than we do. You know, Bible literacy, like I said, is at an all-time high. Churches go from three services a week to two services a week to one service a week. Why? 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 In a land where we are so free to worship God. Why? 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 When the knowledge of God and the power of God and all that stuff is more available to us, that, you know, it's, why do we act like this? Why, why, do, why do things happen this way? It's because we're not hungry. We're not hungry for the things of God. I was in the, in the jail, the detention center, last week, and one of the guys says, you don't get hungry for something until you can't have it no more. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? Lately, I've been hungry for fried chicken. And bless God, you can buy that at most every stop and rob, you know, here in, here in northern Michigan. You can buy it at Walmart. You can buy it at the local corner store. You can buy it at the gas station. And hopefully after a little while... I'll get tired of it because it's not good for me. Amen? 
But I want to tell you guys, the knowledge of God is always good for you. The knowledge of God always brings you power and strength. The, the knowledge of God can allow you to walk in perpetual victory before him. Amen? We here in America have a bunch of misplaced values. We are satisfied by things that should not satisfy, and we're not satisfied by the things that we should be satisfied for. You know, this presentation, presentation this morning of your guys' missions trip and the work that you did should bring us more in touch with what is important and truly needs to be done and accomplished in this world. Somebody give me an amen there. Amen? You know... We are more satisfied if we get a new car than we are if somebody comes to know Jesus personally. You hear what I'm saying? We're more satisfied that our house is neat, clean, and painted, and all that other kind of stuff than we are of taking an advantage of an opportunity to serve and to love and to minister Jesus Christ. And guys, not only you know are we deceived in that way, but it's like we don't have a hunger for the spiritual riches of God. It's like God has prepared for us a banquet table that goes from this side of the church and this side to that side of the church. And it's just full with any kind of food that you can think of. And not just, not just like mainstays, you know, not just potatoes and carrots and whatever. It's filled with excellent food. It's filled with exotic and exquisite food. It's filled with, with food that will make your taste buds go yum, yum, yum and sing, sing, sing. You know what I mean? But it's just like... We're like, oh, we can, we, can, uh, we can eat at this banquet table or we can go turn around and go to McDonald's. And we get in the car and we go to McDonald's and we ignore the riches that God gives us and that he sets before us. If there's one goal that I have for this sermon this morning is that you would become hungry and stirred up about being hungry for the riches of God this morning. I want you to be so hungry for it that, that you cannot rest until you've tasted just a little bit more. I want you to be so thirsty for it that you won't be satisfied until you take another drink from the well of the fountain of rich, the riches of God this morning. Amen? Amen. Guys, I want to tell you we walk around like paupers, but we are truly children of the king. Do you hear what I'm saying this morning? But we are walking way below our privilege because we're not hungering and thirsting after righteousness. There's a promise in the Bible that says that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will what? They will be filled. Amen. We got to be careful that we are feasting on things that don't satisfy here in this country. You know, materialism doesn't satisfy. Achievement, personal achievement, doesn't satisfy. Uh, you know, uh, living in a nice house and having a lot of property, it's a great thing. I, I appreciate it. You know, I got four snowmobiles. I'm not anti-materialistic, but we have to make sure that those things stay in their place in our lives. But the things that we really hunger and thirst after, the things we really want and we really pour out our life for, is the things that are important, that it's the provision of God that he's given us. Amen? You know, prayer. Ugh! I'm so frustrated with my prayer life right now because, you know, I can spend 15 or 20 minutes or half an hour in prayer or I can watch a YouTube video. You know what I'm saying? We make, we're being pressed in areas where we've never been pressed before to make decisions about where, where, what we're going to expose ourselves to. You know, I think about the way that the whole nation went after the Marvel Entertainment Series. Amen? I want to tell you, I saw it. I, I've, I've watched most of the movies. I'm like... I, if I can't be Jesus, I want to be Captain America. You know what I'm saying? I love him. You know, language. No, not everybody gets that joke. You know what I'm saying? But I mean, it's like we fill our lives with those things, but we're not filling our lives with the riches of God. We think about those things, but we don't spend time thinking about the, the riches of God. You know, you know, what if... What if church every Sunday was a gala event like the, uh, the end game reveal was? You know, what if, oh, it's going to be a special reveal Sunday. Just imagine how packed this church should be. Because truly, you know, it's not happening in the movie theater. It's happening here. What God wants to say is not some message of Marvel Comics, but what God wants to say is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? 
First thing that God sent me here to tell you this morning is that he has made an awesome provision for us. He has given us everything. Say it out loud with me. He has given us everything we need for life and godliness this morning. And I just, oh, I just want you guys to get this this morning. All the things that you know about God, all the things that you've experienced about God, all the things that you've felt from him and that you've known from him and that you've sensed from him. I can tell you that no matter what your experience is in, in, the, in this church this morning, is that there's so much more. Say it, out, say it out loud with me. There's so much more. When we think about God and the kingdom of God, we are living as paupers. And I can tell you with absolute certainty that there is more, there is more, there is so much more that we are not tapping into. Amen. You know, guys, how I know is because this church is not full. You know, I, you know how I know is because so many Christians are living not an abundant life, but kind of like a survival life. You know what I mean? From one trial to the next trial, we survive to the next trial, we survive to the next trial. But we're not walking in the complete victory and the complete power that God has for us. From my first point, I just want you to get hungry. I want it to be birthed in your soul. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name that it would be birthed in the soul of those people who are here this morning. That there is so much more, so much more, so much more richness and provision that you have for us that we are not taking advantage of. And Lord, I pray that you put a hunger in the souls of people this morning and in my soul too, Lord. I'm, I got to repent for this just like everybody else. Lord, that I would hunger and long and only be satisfied by the so much more, so much more, so much more you have made available to us in the scriptures. Lord, we thank you for that this morning. Amen. Amen. The Lord God Almighty has made great provision for his people this morning. Be hungry for it. Now let's look at the next verse. Whew. Second Peter 1 through 4, it says, Through these he has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. First thing that we looked at this morning is provision, and the next thing that we're going to be looking at is God's promises. The Lord God Almighty has made great promises for his people. Somebody say amen this morning. Amen. amen. The Lord God Almighty has given us great provision, and the Lord God Almighty has given us great promises this morning. So what's a promise like? And as I was praying and preparing for this uh, message, I just was trying to think about how I could share this with you. How many guys have ever been swimming? Okay. I know that this is Tawas, and there's like a big lake right over there, and there's a bunch of little lakes all around us. Amen. How many guys have ever been swimming, but then you got tired? Okay. And usually in the middle of a lake, they have what they call these floating docks or, you know, just way out, out there a ways from where your regular dock is, where you put your boat. And when you get tired, you can swim out there and you can climb up on the dock. And when you do that, you are free from the effects of the water. Am I, am I, am I clear? You guys understand where I'm going with this? Okay. So this dock, when you're on this dock, you can rest, you can eat, you can read, and you are free from the effects of the water. Amen? Amen. God's promises are like floating docks from which we here in, in the flesh, us Christians who are living for him, we can climb up on those promises and we can escape the corruption of the world. How many guys know that if the water conquers you, you are dead? If the water conquers you, if it swallows you up, you are dead. And if corruption conquers you, it's the same end result. You are also dead. So by standing on God's promises, we climb up on the dock and we are free from the effects of the water. We are free from the effects of, of the corruption. And it doesn't have any power over us to master us and keep us in such a way that it could cause death in our lives. Earthly corruption is killing us spiritually. Guys, I want to tell you, the freedom of God and the power of God and the provision of God is so available to us here in the United States of, uh, uh, of America, uh, but so is corruption. Can I get an amen? 
Guys, it's at every street corner and it's half off. Corruption, you know, sin, it, it's there and it's available to us. It's even to the point where you can't turn on the TV without having it come into your home. You can't turn on the radio without having it come into your home. You can't turn on, you can't listen to the Tigers game without having some of it come into your home. Amen? Now, I'm not the kind of people that makes you think that you just got to go like live on an isolated island all by yourself and stay away from all the things that are evil. No, I'm not like that. I believe that the victory that God gives us within us is sufficient to enable us to stand and, and withstand and overcome the corruption of this world. But I want to tell you that you'll never overcome it unless you're standing on the promises of God. Amen. A promise from God is a statement that we can depend upon with absolute confidence. Here are some promises that we can stand on as Christians this morning. We can trust God for his presence. Hebrews 13, 5, that says, Never will I leave you nor forsake you. We can trust God for his provision. 2 Peter 1 through 3, he has given us everything we need for life and godliness. We can trust God for his leading. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. We can trust God's purposes. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you and plans to give you a hope in the future. We can rely on God's rest, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, which says, Come unto me, all ye that are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We can trust God for his cleansing, 1 John 1, 8, 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I've read to you five or six promises, but this scripture is filled with thousands upon thousands upon thousands of promises that we can stand on and put our faith in and live above the corruption of the world. Now it takes faith, amen, we got to... Take God at his word. We got to do as his promise directs. But when we do that and we walk in that way, we are virtually indestructible. We, we cannot be touched by God the, or Satan. The Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you this morning. Amen. When we're standing on the promises of God, the devil has no means to be able to attack us. Okay, Romans 8, 28, the last promise. We can, always, we can always stand on God's wise plan for all things work together for God, or for all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes. God's promises are a declaration of the truth. It is a reality that is set in motion and sustained by God's care, his character, his nature, and his unmatchability unmatched ability to cause things to act and behave a certain way. And they are in our lives as a result of the heart of love of God and goodness that God has towards mankind and those who trust in him. And I got more good news for you this morning. Amen. Nobody has ever broken a promise of God by leaning on it. Amen. Do you hear what I'm saying? They are fully trustworthy stronger than like the strongest titanium metal that we could ever come up with better better than vibranium this morning uh, to all my captain america friends okay and as you come to know god's promises you will find with certainty that they are completely true and that they never wear out Time again as a preacher and in my personal life, I have seen that what the Bible says to, will come to pass in my life and in the lives of others has. God's truth has sustained me in my trials. My sins have surely found me out. And thank God, I have found God's refreshing and renewal come into my life when I've repented of my sins and confessed them and got back in line with God. And guys, you don't need to take my word uh, for God's promises. If you open up the Bible and you get in here and you begin to read them, when you begin to hide them in your heart and God is allowed to build that little spiritual fortress inside of you through the words, you will, you'll be able to find out personally that God's word is true. Amen. You'll be able to find out that it is a safe place to stand upon and that by being there, you can withstand any attack of the evil one and anything that life happens to throw at you this 
morning. That's how powerful and how good the Word of God is. Amen? Um, it is important that we learn to stand on the promises of God because it's standing on the promises that keeps us from the corruption of the world. I mean, there are many people. How many of you guys have ever met a person who's totally corrupt? Pretty corrupt. You know what I'm saying? They don't know how to tell the truth anymore. Their reality is really messed up. You know, like, this is real and that's real. And you know that they're just, you know, they're just, they're just, they're just whack. They're like, their brain is blown. Their heart is blown. And their spiritual sense is nonsense. Amen? This morning. When we stand upon the promises of God, we are able to stay on that safe dock in the middle of the lake. We are able to shed the effects of the corruption that's trying to kill us. Amen? And we can be in a safe place where God wants us to be by standing on his promises. God's promises will keep you from the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. And the Lord God Almighty has great promises for his people, but we got to be hungry for them too. Just like we need to be hungry for God's provision, we need to be hungry for God's promises. We need to learn them. We have to know them. We have to hide them in our heart. You know, whenever you find yourself in a really hard time, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit leads inside of you, and the Holy Spirit will speak to you, and he'll direct you to a promise of God. But the Holy Spirit can't direct you to a promise that you've never hidden in your heart. you got to give the Holy Spirit something to work with by hiding God's word in your heart so that you won't sin against him. Amen? You know, oh, I just, it's burning in my heart. I, I almost wonder if I should just stop and camp here. But we got to be hungry for them, church. we got to be hungry for them. We've got to be hungry for the provision of God and the things of God. And we've got to be hungry for the promises of God if we want them to be effective in our life. Now let's go ahead and look at the next passage of Scripture here. 2 Peter 1-5. through 5. This is my last point. But I'm not going to say I'm done preaching because any preacher who says that is lying. Okay? But I will tell you that we're on my last point this morning, 2 Peter 1, 5 through 9, which says, For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in an increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind, and he has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. So not only has the Lord made great provision for us, and not only has he given us great promises, God has also given us the prescription to apply them to our lives. Now, when you're a doctor, doctor has all kinds of medical resources available to them. And God's provision is kind of like a pill, okay? It's like a pill that you can take to make whatever's going on in your life a little bit better. But just like the doctor on every single pill bottle writes out these little instructions about when you're supposed to take it, how you're supposed to take it, how many you're supposed to take it, God's word in this passage of scripture is talking about the provision by which we need to apply his word to our lives and so that it'll be fruitful and helpful to us in our lives. You know, if you got a provision and if you've got a promise, you definitely need to to find out what the prescription is, the way that you need to apply it into your lives this morning. Amen? Now, God's prescription on how to apply his provision and his promises in our life starts out with it like this. It's faith. Now, everybody starts on faith. That's like first base. That's like the first rung in the ladder. That's like, you know, that's the beginning of your faith walk. We start out with faith. Talked to you about it a little bit earlier. At one point in your heart, God, by his Holy Spirit, puts a little bit of faith in your heart. And then the, at the next point, he comes along and the Holy Spirit gives you a revelation of Jesus Christ. And you put those two together and bam, just like a seed that's germinate and starts growing, your faith in Jesus Christ begins to grow. So basically, faith, though, should be a progressive Active Christianity. 
Um, it is by faith alone that we are saved by grace, but this faith does not continue by itself. It has to grow in our lives. God's word in our life needs to grow in our lives. Our spiritual life needs to grow. And maybe we start out like a little acorn, but one day we can be like a mighty, mighty, mighty oak. Amen. Trees of righteousness for the kingdom of God. Amen. So we start out with faith, and then we add to it goodness. And goodness is excellence of achievement or mastery in a specific field. In the case of godliness, it is virtue or moral excellence. And in Philippians chapter 4, there's a word that talks about that, and it is excellence that enriches life. How many of you guys have ever seen a righteous dude or a righteous I call them women of God or a little wog. I call them wogs sometimes. But how many of you guys have ever seen somebody so in tune with God and so walking with God that their life speaks volumes to you and it, and it makes you want to be more like them? Amen. Maybe they were kind when they had an opportunity to be mean. Maybe they were patient when they had an opportunity to lose their temper. But they were different and you noticed. Amen. Moral virtue that, 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 that when displayed... Uh, is an excellent display of living. After goodness comes knowledge, and that's a knowledge of God that results in godly living with the demonstration of his likeness. The Bible says that if you don't, if you don't do what God wants you to do, you don't know him. You hear what I'm saying? You can say that you know God, but unless you're like him, unless you live like him, you don't know him. You're living like you don't know him, Amen. Now, there are backsliders, people who know him, and then they, they get away from living that way, and hopefully that they get repentance or conviction come in their life, and they come back home and they start living that way. Amen? But basically, God says the proof is in the pudding. If you claim my name, you've got to live like me. If you say you are a Christian, your life needs at least in part to resemble Christ's likeness. Amen? So, knowledge of God that demonstrates a similarity of his likeness. After that, we have to add self-control. To knowledge, we add self-control. Self-control is the exact opposite of the excesses and the greed of the false teachers that Peter is talking about and the sexual abuses that were prevalent in the pagan world in which he lived. How many guys you know that we also live in a pagan world where sexual uh, uh, excess is prevalent? Amen. You know what I'm talking about this morning? Self-control, actually the revelation of God's grace, teaches us to say no to those things which are not godly. You know, sometimes it takes us a couple times learning, you know, how many guys go through that process of learning? You know, I don't, I'm not feeling real comfortable about this. Oh, I get burned. Oh, I'm not feeling really comfortable about this. Oh, I get burned, and then I make the decision, well, I'm just going to leave this alone because whenever I mess with this, I just keep getting burned. Amen? God wants us to exercise self-control so that we learn to steer ourselves away from the areas where we keep stumbling and fumbling and bumbling and sinning because we know that when we mess around in those areas, we just get burned. Amen? Okay, we add to our self-control perseverance, and perseverance... This is a virtue that views time with God's eyes while waiting for Christ's return and for the punishment of sin. Perseverance is the ability to continue in the faith and to resist the pressures of the world system. And I want to tell you guys, sometimes perseverance is all you got going for you. You know, you, you're, you feel like the cat that's been out all night long and he's dragging himself home because he just wants to go to sleep. And, you know, maybe you got some rocks thrown at you or maybe you got kicked or, or whatever. You guys know what I'm talking about this morning? And it's like when you feel like all hope is gone and you just want to quit and cash in your chips, you can't. Why can't you? Because God has called you to persevere. God has called you and he said, come on, keep going. Just a little bit further. You can make it. You get past this, you're going to be doing just great. Just keep on moving. Persevere. You can do it. You can overcome. And through the encouragement and the grace of God, because, you know, it's the grace of God that gets us all over all the humps we can't get through in our, in our own natural flesh and strength, right? Um, perseverance allows us to stand and withstand 
and stand and withstand and stand and withstand the influence of the worldliness and the corruption of this world, but not bite. It allows us to overcome it. By standing on God's promises, those waves may come and try to knock us off the dock and try to knock us off the dock and try to knock us off the dock. But if we stand upon God's promises and we, we trust him that we can persevere and that we're going to persevere, if we listen to his encouragement, then we continue in the way of faith. After that, to our perseverance, we add godliness, which is piety or devotion to the person of God. It's, divine, it's defined as a very practical awareness of God in every aspect of life. Man, when I think of this, I think, oh, how I have fallen. You know, I used to, I used to ask God to be involved in all the different parts of my life. There were days, like when I was in Bible college, I'd go to chapel between classes you know, just so I could talk to him about what was going on in the class. You know what I'm saying? Um, and it's like inviting God in and walking in his fullness and letting him be part of every little piece of your life. How many of you guys know that God wants to be involved in everything? You know what? There's no thing that happens in your life that is so small that God does not want to be involved. You know what I mean? You know, I pl recently planted some seeds and... You know, I'm really excited about planting and growing, you know what I mean? And you can pray over those seeds. You can ask God to give them growth. You know, I learned so much about the Bible from planting the garden because the Bible talks about sowing and reaping and different things like that. God wants to be involved in all of those things. You know, that really impossible person that you're facing at work? God wants to be involved with that. In fact, I'll tell you the first thing I ever prayed about is I got a $35 car back in 1987. And uh, it had broken studs on the, um, on the exhaust manifold, okay? And I crawled up underneath that car, and I don't know, I'm just barely knowing God right now. And I asked, and I, I fought with those things. I probably fought with them for a couple hours. And then I asked God's help. I said, God, would you please help me to get these exa exhaust studs off? And and it moved. And then I wiggled it back. And then it moved a little more. Then I lifted it back. And it moved a little more. And I wiggled it back. And then I was able to get it unscrewed and it came out the way it should. You know what I mean? We can ask for God's help in everything. And we need to be con God conscious about everything that goes on in our life. You know, our stress level would go way, 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 way down if we talk to God more about everything that's going on in our life. And not just let it stress us out. You hear what I'm saying this morning? Okay, we add to perseverance, godliness, and then to godliness, brotherly kindness, which is the knowledge of God that flows into love for others. You cannot say that you love God and hate your brother. That's, that's, that's wrong. You cannot say that you love God and hate somebody in your heart. Amen? How can you love God who you've not seen and hate somebody who that you have? You know what I'm saying? That love and that hate is incompatible. They both can't live in your heart or in your life. Or you'll be sending mixed messages to everybody. The word here, um, Philadelphia, the brother, the, that's the kind of love he's talking about. It denotes the warmth of affection that should characterize the fellowship of believers. I want to tell you guys, I'm a pastor. I haven't pastored for a few years, but there are times... When I've had congregation members that rub me wrong. And I want to tell you that they're not all easy to get along with. And they're not always glad that you're their pastor. You know what I'm saying? But love has got to be the foundation. You know what I'm saying? we got to love each other through those patches. we got to love each other and accept each other. And trust God to bring maturity in the other people's lives. Usually if they're rubbing you wrong, the problem is yours. You know what I'm saying? It's not something that they're doing. It's there's a fault in your own life that you need to self-examine. But we need to have brotherly kindness. And the last thing that we need to have or add to brotherly kindness is love. And this denotes a self-sacrificing action in behalf of the others. This love flows from God who, himself, who is himself love. It's agape. It is the kind of love that reaches the world. And godly people who participate in divine nature must abound in love. You got to be loving. You got to be a loving person. You know, uh, in the jail, we have a lot of very difficult 
uh, kids come through, and some of them have really bad attitudes, and some of them are whiner babies and cry babies and all that other kind of stuff. But I know I must be making a little bit of difference there because when we have an unlovable kid, the, all, my, all my teammates say, you go, you go handle that one. You go love on this one. You go take care of that one. You know, when they just want to tell him to shut up, I've got to say, you know, you're going to make it. You know, I've had 100 kids in here before, and I, have, I haven't lost any of them, so just hang in there. You're going to make it through this experience. You know what I'm saying? Love. I have a difficult neighbor that I, I just have to choose to keep on loving. You guys have people in your life who are very difficult, but you, if you have God living within you, you've got the, the love of God living in you. That's the agape kind of love, and you need to be able to let that love shine towards other people. And you gotta, you can ask for God's help to love somebody. You know, you can't stay angry at somebody that you regularly pray for. It's just impossible. When your heart is broken for somebody and you begin to see things that God reveals to you about why they're such who they are, you know what I mean? There's this one very difficult kid that we had in the detention center, and he was on all of ours last nerve. But if you read his history, you, you see that when he was two years old, his mom gave him over to be used as a sex toy. It's like, you're not going to make it through an experience like that without being warped. And everybody that you come up against is battling something. Everybody has an unspoken like that in their life that causes them sometimes to be mean, causes them sometimes to be unreasonable, causes them sometimes to be a blooming idiot, okay? You got to let the love of God flow through you. You got you to gotta open up your heart to them, and you got you to gotta love, love God or love them with God's help. Ask for God's help because God can make the impossible possible. You may feel like it's impossible for you to love that person, but it is possible with God's help. Amen? Amen. 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 It's important, like the scripture says, that we keep adding these virtues to our lives in an ever-increasing manner because they will keep us fruitful and productive in our spiritual lives. In fact, if we don't add faith to our goodness and goodness to our knowledge and knowledge, uh, self-control to our knowledge and perseverance to our self-control and godliness and brotherly kindness and love, it's like we've forgotten that we were ever saved in the first place. We, we've forgotten that we have been forgiven of our sins if we don't keep working this process in our lives. Um, and it's important that we apply this to every area of our lives. You know, we all have strengths, you know, things that we naturally take to and we embody and all that other kind of stuff. But, you know, in every single area of your life, you've got to start out with faith. And then you've got to add the rest of these things to it. In areas where you're weak, you've got to ask for God's help. And then you've got to start adding this prescription to your life, growing in every one of these areas. You know why brotherly kindness and love are the last two? Because when you're a Christian and you start, you know, walking in the Spirit and you start, you know, adding all this stuff to your life and you start feeling good about your walk and everything, it's easy to get prideful. There's something about knowledge and a little bit of self-righteousness and a little bit of God consciousness and somehow in, in humanity that kind of brings pride in our hearts and, and we get this, we have to fight this thing that we're better than everybody else. You know what I mean? It's just like... Because we think we're gods, we're something special. You know, we are. We're his sons and his, and, our, and his daughters. And I don't want to take away from that. But we can't allow it to change the, the reality that we're still sinners saved by grace. And just everybody else is sinners saved by grace. So when you're doing really well in that area, just make sure to add brotherly kindness. Just make sure to add love. You know, maybe there's an area that you know about. How many of you guys have ever stopped and asked for directions? Okay? When you stop and you ask for directions, have you ever had a person talk to you who makes you feel stupid? Like, you don't know this? You know, and they're, and they're sure to tell you why you're doing that. You know, when you're doing well, people will come to ask you questions. When you give that answer, make sure that you do it out of brotherly kindness. Make sure that you do it out of love. You know what I'm saying? When, when somebody comes to you for help in the things of the faith, and, you know, sometimes even like, 
You know, I've had, I've had kids who I think are total reprobates ask me to pray for them to receive the Lord. And you know why I do it? Not because I think they're going to turn into instant Christians, but because they asked me to. And when I did it, I didn't say, well, what do you, why would you want to pray to God? I'm like, no, let's go ahead and pray to God. Yeah, you know, it's a wonderful thing. When you pray with somebody to receive the Lord, you put a little seed in their heart because they prayed the prayer too, right? They wouldn't have prayed it unless they asked. And you give God something to work with a little bit later. Now, you know, when you plant a seed, you don't get a tree tomorrow, okay? But when the seed is planted in somebody's life, God can do something with that, amen? And guys, the bottom line is that without love, what we do is worth nothing. Without love, what we do is absolutely nothing. If we don't minister in love, the ministry that we think that we have is absolutely worth nothing nothing. The Bible says, you know, if I give my body to the flames, I don't do it in love. If I surrender everything that I have and give it all to the poor, but don't do it in love, it's a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. That's why love and brotherly kindness is at the end of that list, because brotherly kindness and love is very, 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 very important. And without love, nothing, nothing changes. It, it doesn't make a difference. So the Lord God Almighty has made great provision for his people. I'm just going to make you say it one more time just because I want to, okay? He has given us what? Everything. For life and godliness, amen? How about just one more time? I just want to hear it one more time. You know, the best thing about this sermon, okay, and this is being selfish, but... I just love preaching the good news. I'm preaching about God's provision. I'm preaching about God's promises. I'm preaching about his prescription. And you know what? You can't help but preach on that and feel blessed. You know what I'm saying? So if this doesn't do anything for you guys, I'm really feeling blessed preaching this sermon this morning. Amen? Amen. Just one more, one more time. He has given us what? Everything. For a life and godliness this morning. God has given us Great promises, promises that we can stand upon and escape the corruption of the sinful nature and of the world. And the last thing that he's given us is a great prescription for his people. You know, guys, I really want you to be hungry for the provision of God. I, I don't want you to leave this place with just a a new knowledge of something maybe that you hadn't heard before. When you leave this place this morning, I, I want you to be hungry for God and the things of God in a way that, that maybe you haven't been for a long time or for some of you maybe in a way that you never had. I'm not going to prolong this altar call. I'm going to ask you guys as the worship team comes and prepares to, to minister in song, I'm going to ask you guys to find a place of prayer somewhere here in the church. You can stay in your seat and pray. You can come up here and spend some time at the altars and pray. But I just want you to spend, I want you to spend 10, 15, 20 minutes just asking God to birth a hunger in you for the things of God this morning. That's the only thing I want you to ask him for. And I want you to ask, ask him for it for the next 10, 15, or 20 minutes, okay? When God is done talking to you about that, when he's done dealing with you about that, you are free to go. I'm just going to ask that if you leave the service, that you go out the back door and you don't start talking until you're out there in the lobby. But right now, I'm just going to ask you guys to find a place of prayer, and I'm going to ask you to ask God to give you that hunger for the things of his provision. A hunger for his provision, a hunger for his promises, and a hunger for his prescription. Let's go ahead and start singing. The altars are open. Find a place of prayer, and I want you to spend some time talking to God this morning. And if you need prayer about anything, I'm going to be sitting up here on the front, front row, and I'd be glad to pray with you about anything. It doesn't have to be about the provision of God or anything like that. Just any area of your life where you need some help from him this morning, I just want to be available to pray for you this morning. So on your mark, get set, let's pray.